Hey folks, I'm Dumotro. Welcome back to Combo oh, Class, where today I want to tell you about something that many people call the 3x plus 1 problem, more formally known as the Colatz Conjecture. The Colatz Conjecture, sometimes pronounced Colatz, is one of the simplest unsolved questions in mathematics. Many people have tried to solve this thing with no success yet, and if anyone does prove or disprove it, there's a prize of 120 million yen, a foreign currency, that once that amount translated to over one million dollars, currently worth somewhere between eight and nine hundred thousand dollars. This problem, despite being unsolved, is quite simple to describe. You take a whole number. If it's even, you split it in half. If it's odd, you triple it and add one. And then you repeat that process with the new number you generated and repeat it again and again. This conjecture states that if you iterate this process starting from any whole number, it'll end up falling into the same loop or cycle that the number one does. And if the conjecture is false, that would mean that some numbers either fall into a different loop of their own or spiral upward, growing arbitrarily large without bounds. And today, I want to not only tell you about it and about some ways it might be important, but also see how since this is a base independent trait and we happen to write things in base 10, if we go outside of the box a little bit and look at some of these patterns in binary or base 2 instead, we're going to see some cool shortcuts. We'll also look at some extensions to which types of number we allow in this process. Now, let me explain this question a little more clearly with a visual demonstration. Let's say that I have a pile of some amount of item, like I'm using dice here, and if the pile is an even amount at a given stage, then I'll split it in half, like I gave half away to a friend. And if the pile is an odd number at any point, I'm going to apply a rule where I triple the amount of it, plus one. What would happen if I continue that process starting from different sizes of piles? Well, starting from the number one, it may seem pretty trivial because one will triple plus one into four, which will be cut in half to two, which will be cut in half to one, and then that cycle will continue. Four, two, one, four, two, one, etc. But what if I had started with a pile of three? Well, three is odd, so I'm going to need to triple it plus one. And when I put that together, that makes 10. 10 is even, so I'll split it in half. Five is odd, so I'm going to need to triple plus one. Here are the three fives plus one, giving me 16, which can be split in half into eight, which can be split in half into four, which brings us to the four, two, one, four, two, one loop. So three ends up in the same place that those other ones did, but it took a little longer. Now, if I had started with a pile of 27 dice, I wouldn't have had enough dice or enough room here to do the full cycle because after about 75 steps of the process, I would be at a pile of over 9,000 dice. But if you continue the chain a little further, although after 75 steps from the number 27, you're at a number in the 9,000s, if you continue further, by the time you get to 111 steps, you do hit the 421 loop. With some starting numbers, these piles quickly grow large enough that you're not going to want to use fair physical items to demonstrate them. You're going to want to write them down in some way. Typically, the base 10 way that we write numbers, like 3 could be a starting number that leads to 10, to 5, to 16, to 8, 4, 
two, one, and a loop. Here are the chains the first few numbers would lead to under this process, and all of them end up at 421, 421. Some of them taking longer than others. And here's a tree-like visualization of how some other numbers make their way down to that 421 loop. But it's a little hard to tell when looking at a chain like this when it's going to go downward or upward. Whenever we're at an odd number, tripling it and adding one sends us to an even number. But when we're at an even number, how can we tell when it's just going to go down to an odd once before hopping back to another even? Or when it's going to go down to a few evens in a row? Well, our base 10 way of writing numbers actually hides some of those traits. And if we look at this chain written in binary or base 2, we're going to see a lot of those patterns much clearer. Here's that same chain written in binary. Like 3 would be written 1, 1, 10 would be written 1, 0, 1, 0, and so on. And in binary, not only are even numbers precisely the numbers that end in a 0, and odd numbers precisely the numbers that end in a 1, but if we have an even number that ends in a 0, to cut it in half, all we have to do is remove the 0. 1010 zero, zero sent us to 101. And it's true that to cut a number in half, you remove a zero place from the end of it. Sort of like in base 10, to divide a number by 10, you could chop a zero off the end of it. And so to get from an even number that has a single zero at the end to the odd number it'll create, we just have to cut off that zero. And what about a number with multiple zeros? Well, if we cut off that zero, we're left with more zeros to cut. Cut another zero, cut another zero, until we're down to that one. Here it would look like a 110 one cycle, but that's the number four. That's the number two written in binary. And we can see that if I have a number with a bunch of zeros at the end, I could sort of skip a few phases because those phases are just going to be chopping off those zeros one at a time. So let's say I'm investigating one of these chains in binary and I get to a number that looks like 1101010. One, zero, one, zero, zero. Well, that's even because it ends in a zero and cutting it in half sends it to the same thing with one less zero at the end, which goes to another zero being trimmed. And it's sort of like, instead of going through two extra steps, I could have just had part of my process include when there's a bunch of zeros at the end, trim them off and look at that number. So what about when we have an odd number and we want to triple it and add one? Well, binary's better at doubling than tripling things. If I wanted to double this, I could take the same set of digits with an extra zero at the end, and that would be twice that original. But luckily, doubling something can get us to its tripled state if we add it to the original. Something plus twice itself equals three times itself. But we want 3x plus 1, so instead of adding a number with itself in binary plus an extra 0 at the end, we can add it with itself in binary with an extra 1 at the end. That's the original number. That's twice the original plus one. So when we add them, we're gonna get three times plus one. Now we can add this sort of like normal addition you're used to, carrying things, but now carrying as soon as we get to a two, which looks like 10 in binary. So one plus one gives us a zero and a carried one. One plus one, another zero and a carried one. Once again, zero and a carried one. Now we got three of them, so we actually have one there still and a carried one. One and one gets me to another carried one and we're all the way up to this number which is three times the original 
plus one. Technically, in the way you're more used to them, it would look like 13, and those add up to 40. But look how much easier it is here. Not only was I able to do the 3x plus one stage by adding something to its own string slid over with an extra one at the end, but now I'm left with a binary number where I can just trim all the zeros and know that after a few steps of being cut in half, I'll end up at that number, which is just five. So I know that 40 then goes to 20, to 10, to five. But instead of having to go through all of those steps, I just trimmed off all the zeros. So although normally this is described as a two-step process where you have to check at each stage if a number is even or odd before seeing which operation to apply to it, in an accelerated version which gives us the same end result, we can just write the number in binary, remove any trailing zeros, and then repeat the process of going to 3x plus 1 for the result and removing any trailing zeros and repeating. But although this is a lot easier... computers to calculate larger batches of numbers, and large batches of numbers have been checked. More than one quintillion numbers have been checked and shown to fall into that 421, 421 cycle eventually. But computers checking a bunch of numbers isn't going to prove something about the infinite amount of natural numbers. It's going to take some mathematical creativity mixed in there. And some might say, how could you prove anything about an infinite amount of numbers? But we've proven there's an infinite amount of prime numbers before, and many cool things about the infinite amount of natural numbers have been proven. If people ever do manage to prove whether every natural number falls into this 4 to one loop, or whether some numbers have other loops, or some numbers spiral to arbitrarily large sizes, which of those cases is true won't really be what's important. 3x plus 1 is a bit arbitrary and random, and not necessarily fundamental to nature, but this problem does represent a category of types of proof about infinite sets of number that math can't achieve yet. And if there is a proof of one of those cases, the techniques used in the proof will be what's important. Techniques that can prove things about infinite sets of number that we don't currently have in our toolbox that might help us on other open questions as well. Now, progress has been made on this question over the years, although it still hasn't been fully cracked. And mathematicians have also looked at other extensions to this question. Like, what if we repeated the same process, but also allowed negative numbers? Well, if I took negative one, that is odd. And so I go to three times it plus one, which sends me to negative two, which is even, gets cut in half back to negative one, and it's true that negative one and negative two can be considered to have their own loop that some negative numbers fall into. Zero could also be considered to have its own loop, and there are two other negative number loops that have been discovered. This one where negative five ends up going all the way to negative 10 and back, and this longer one where negative 17 goes through a bunch of steps before getting sent back there. Mathematicians have also investigated other extensions, like applying this procedure to certain fractions or to imaginary and complex numbers. In fact, here's an awesome picture of a fractal that can be generated if you iterate a similar process on the complex plane and color coded. Now this general question of whether all positive integers fall into this loop has become quite oh, popular as far as mathematical open questions go. Many great mathematicians have set their minds to this issue, and for some reason, it still hasn't, and maybe never will be, solved. Thanks for joining me to learn about what some people call the 3x plus 1 problem. And yeah, in binary, that's how we would write 3. There are also other shortcuts you could try when expressing these loops in other bases, like base 3...
or six? Leave a comment if you have any other ways in which an algorithm could use a base to speed up this process. And that's all for today's lesson. Next chat, whoa, 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 Carlo, the, the glove's on fire. The Thanks for joining me for today's episode. Make sure you're also tuned into my Demotro channel if you want bonus footage like live streams and such. And special thanks to my Patreon supporters who help make this show possible. And special thanks to Dandelion. All right, I'll see you all in the next one.